just pray for fresh outpouring of God's Spirit on each of our hearts and lives in the coming year. You know, so many times we look at what's wrong, and God wants us to look to Him for what He can do through us. And if we will just be open and responsive to what He has to say, I just believe that there are great things ahead for this church, for our lives, for all that He has in store. Uh, any other needs we need to mention this morning? Right, then as we prepare our hearts for prayer, let's sing the hymn number 273, and then we'll stand and look to the Lord in prayer for the conclusion of the song. <coughs> Thank you. you. may be seated. 
I'll be reading this morning from the book of Isaiah, chapter 42. We'll be combining that with the passage that we read from Matthew at the beginning of the service, from Matthew chapter 3. Isaiah 42, verses 1 through 9. Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice in the earth. And the coastlands wait for his teaching. Thus says God the Lord who created the heavens and stretched them out, who spread out the earth and what comes from it, who gives breath to the people upon it and spirit to those who walk in it. I am the Lord. I have called you in righteousness. I have taken you by the hand and kept you. I have given you as a covenant to the people, a light to the nations, to open the eyes that are blind, to bring out the prisoners from the dungeon, from the prison those who sit in darkness. I am the Lord, that is my name. My glory I give to no other, nor my praise to idols. See, the former things have come to pass, and new things I now declare. Before they spring forth, I tell you of them. Father in heaven, we do thank you for your word this day. We pray that you will help us as we spend these few minutes looking at it together, that we just might be faithful to walk in the light of all you have to say. Your holy name we do ask it. Amen. When Isaiah wrote these words to the people of Israel, he was called to speak to a people that were basically dislocated, discouraged, just ultimately defeated. They felt not only lost, but felt they had been neglected by God. And guess what? We all know better, but once in a while, I think most of us go through that moment where we'd like to wave a little red flag and say, hey, did you remember I'm still here? Well, guess that's the place these people were in. It must have hit home. Isaiah and Jeremiah had already prophesied to the people that if they didn't repent and turn back to God, that God was going to allow judgment to come on them and they would be sent in exile from the land. But yet, for some reason, they chose not to obey. Many of them, out of rebellion, others just simply kind of like, well, you know how we say something, well, that won't. You know, that's not going to happen, so I'll just take a chance. And many of them were putting a false security that God's temple was in Jerusalem, and therefore he would not allow destruction to come upon it. Well, guess what? The destruction came. And now, it was bad enough that they were in this situation. But to be in that situation, knowing they didn't have to be in that situation, would have made it that much worse. You know, I think one of the most irritating phrases in the English language is, I told you so. <laughs> and we, uh, you know, I've caught myself a couple times when I've almost said it to someone, and I really don't like it if, you know, someone says it, you know, well, I told you so. But the reality is, Isaiah's message could have been, I told you so. I told you this is what was going to happen, and it did. But instead of telling the people of Israel that, he gives them this beautiful promise of God's love, of a Messiah that was coming, that would raise them up and restore things the way they were. But unfortunately, they kind of forgot the description of the Messiah that 
Isaiah told them was coming. From the passage in Matthew 3 that we read at the beginning of the service, people were living in expectation of the Messiah. John the Baptist was already preaching, trying to show people that one was coming who was going to deliver them from their sins. Yet, uh, in spite of all that, they were, they had taken the promise of the Messiah and created the Messiah that they wanted instead of the Messiah that they needed. And therefore, as Jesus came, and John recognized who Jesus was, and Jesus wanted to submit to John for baptism, I, I can't be too hard on John. He said, wait, 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 wait. Why would I baptize you? I have need to be baptized by your ministry. But no, Jesus told John he came because he was this humble servant, living everything as we did. This is necessary so that all scripture might be fulfilled. No one denies that the people of Israel were mistreated in their years of captivity. Even when King Cyrus, the Persian uh, emperor, had granted permission for the Israelites to return to Jerusalem, they were still under the authority of a foreign king, and even though he helped them rebuild the temple, it wasn't as good as the temple they had before. There were all kinds of problems. But, now their human nature took over, and instead of accepting the Messiah that was promised here in chapter 42 of Isaiah, they were looking for the Messiah they wanted, a mighty warrior one who was going to give them justice. But the justice talked about in Isaiah 42 and the justice that Jesus came to bring were not necessarily the same. Somehow I think in our culture today we almost inter interchange the term justice and revenge. And they're very different things. Justice is always doing what is right. And really, what many of the Israelites wanted in Jesus' day was a Messiah that was going to come powerfully and take vengeance on all who had oppressed them. There's only one problem when justice is carried out in that way. What one person views as justice, someone else views as revenge. And before you know it, then they need revenge for what happened, and you have, you know, almost a uh, Hatfields and McCoys type thing from old West Virginia. It doesn't work. The description of the Messiah that was promised in Scripture paints a very different picture than a conquering king. Oh, Jesus will conquer all evil, but... It said he would come first as a servant. Well, now there's one thing we learn about people with great authority, especially dictators and kings. Um, service is not usually their strong point. People serve them, and they expect people to serve them and wait on their needs. But it said the Messiah that was coming would be first God's servant. The Spirit of God would be upon him and he would bring forth justice to the nations. But it didn't say he was coming with a mighty sword. It said he was coming, what? He will not cry or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed will not break and a dimly burning wick he will not quench. He will, however, faithfully bring forth justice, and he will not grow faint or be crushed until he has established justice on the earth. What a beautiful description. The conquering Messiah 
was coming as a humble servant. The problem that many of the followers of Judaism in Jesus' day was they had been so busy creating their own image of what the Messiah was that they weren't able to recognize Jesus when he came to them. I know I love working with the kids at the school play, but there's one thing I always learn. Once in a while there'll be a song where there's a way that a note just seems to go naturally, but it's not the one written in the book. Well, okay, if you're performing for yourself, that's great. But when you're working with a group, it helps if everyone's on the same page. And I always tell them, even when someone says, well, it's harder to do it that way. Sometimes they even admit, yes, it is. But it's easier to learn it right than to unlearn what you've done wrong. When you think about that, that same principle is true as to how we need to grow in our love for Jesus and how we need to grow spiritually. We need to learn to let go of what our expectations are and follow what His expectations are. It's so easy to determine what we think we need. The difference is He knows what we need. I love this verse that says he will not stand on the street. I've heard self-proclaimed prophets who like to stand on the street corner and yell their message. I, I know when we lived in Sacramento, there was a man who loved to stand on the street corner and loudly declare that Sacramento was on its way to hell. Well, some of the laws, you know, part of that may be true. But the bottom line is his message wasn't reaching anyone because everyone walked by and said, what an idiot. Jesus learned how to connect with the people that needed his gift of salvation. Jesus was able to preach to who? To the tax collectors, to the sinners, that those that the spiritual people criticized Jesus for hanging around. But guess what? They were willing to hear what Jesus had to say. Why? Because they didn't have to unlearn their own bad thinking. They were able to respond to what Jesus had to say. You know, there's a real example for us there today. And I know, and I, please don't think for a minute, that I think we should ever water down our witness about salvation or what God expects. But I will say, people are much more interested in what we do than what we say. I learned that Valerie's aunt and uncle spent about 35 years in South Africa ministering to um, you know, I, I realize missionary work today often takes place more in cities and it's more like, you know, church here today. But when they went in the 1940s, there were times where they lived in some very crude housing and some very, uh, shall we say, well, I would say anytime you have a mamba snake curled around your curtain rod, you know, that, that's kind of a rough area to be living. But, let me tell you, the one thing her uncle always said, and he mentioned it when we were starting in marriage, he said, people respond to their needs, not what you tell them they need. And most of the mission work was started by starting medical clinics. Her aunt was a nurse. Well, okay, nurses can't do everything, but when the closest doctor was 100 miles away and no transportation to get there, a nurse was a pretty good thing to have. And they were able to reach out. 
They were able to start schools and teach people that wouldn't have had any hope of learning how to read were able. And listen, as people saw their needs met, then they were interested in hearing about the spirituality that they were trying to proclaim. Let me tell you, all of those people in any of these tribes, any lands, most people had a religion. They needed to be shown that Jesus was better than what they had. And that doesn't come by just telling them. Were someone to stand up and say, you were worshipping a pagan idol. Well, that may be true. But what happened? A wall would go up. By showing them who Jesus was, by ministering to their needs, great things could happen. We need to be able to reflect that attitude to those that we come in contact with today. We live in a world that is full of turmoil and dissension. And people don't need to be told they were wrong. People don't just need to be told, I told you so, that if you kept doing this, you'd end up in a mess. No. I realize that we can't always take care of all the physical needs of those around us, but we need to be able to show Jesus' love to those that come in contact with us. Somehow I believe if we will pray for them that God will give us opportunities of service. I remember many years ago when we were working with a congregation and we had very little money and two small kids, but we saw an ad in a catalog for ten copies of the New Testament for under ten dollars. And we prayed about it. And by the way, we had to pray about the ten dollars too. I'll, I'll give you that. But we spent it. Now, we hadn't given Bibles out before, but within, I believe, six to eight weeks we had homes for all those testaments from people many that just sought out the church um, I remember believe it or not it still happened even in the 1990s three guys jumped out of a box car when they saw the church steeple and wanted breakfast and God's word now, that's nothing we could have planned. But we had the means of ministering to them. And, you know, they didn't get much for breakfast, but hey, they at least got fit. So, you know, we, we did what we could do. Listen, we are called to be, not to do necessarily great things, but to let God do great things through us. I always get to, I always get sort of angry when I see a cartoon or something on TV where someone starts to do something unkind or tell a lie and the cartoon predicts a lightning bolt coming down from heaven to zap someone. Listen, that's not the God that we serve. He wants us to demonstrate humility. I, uh, I watched a, uh, it, it was in no way a spiritual movie, but I watched a, a movie on television this past week. Um, it was with Reba McIntyre, and the name of it was called The Hammer. And she happened to be a judge, and she earned the nickname because when someone jumped over the witness stand and was ready to attack her, she took her gap. Socked them. But she was a no-nonsense judge who made the law firm. Well, let me tell you, we're called to be servants, not hammers. We're called to demonstrate Jesus' love. And just as Jesus had crowds that followed him, people will respond to knowing that the presence of God is among his people. Can we pray that that will happen? We need to pray for opportunities to share our faith. We need to pray for opportunities to witness to those around us. 
sometimes I think I say this sometimes I think we're afraid to do that because we're afraid God might do it <laughs> listen we need to be faithful we need to demonstrate the servanthood that Jesus did to respond and be his witness so that many might be brought into his kingdom Precious Heavenly Father, we do thank you for your word this day. We thank you for what you have to say to each and every one of us. And now we would just ask that you would equip us to do your will. Just guide, protect, direct in all things. Holy name, do ask. I'd like us to sing in closing this morning, <coughs> Seek ye first. And may that just be the prayer of our hearts, that we will seek Him first and walk in the light of His will.